All right. Well, thanks so much, uh, everyone, for joining us for the weekly Garden Hour. We're always happy to uh, get on and do this program, talk about the horticulture happenings around the state, um, things that we're seeing in communities across Missouri, emails and questions that we're getting um, from folks across the state, help bring that information to you uh, so you can learn about some of the issues that we're seeing how to come overcome those issues, and then just kind of other timely topics that can help you out uh, in the garden this time of year. Uh, and, and thanks everybody for joining us. Um, just so you know, um, we have horticulture specialists all across the state of Missouri, and we are here to help you. Uh, we're here to be a resource to connect you to uh, science-based information to help you make informed decisions in the garden. Um, and we're here to support home gardeners and growers across the state of Missouri. So if you haven't ever reached out to your local horticulture specialist and have questions that they could help you out with, um, we strongly encourage you to do that as, as we are here to help. Um, you are all joining us via Zoom. We also have the Garden Hour stream live on YouTube. Uh, so keep that in mind if, if you would like to join another way or know other folks that would like to participate in the Garden Hour. Um, we also take uh, a snippet from every Garden Hour, uh, kind of like a highlight of that week's presentation. And then we go ahead and upload that to our MUIPM YouTube channel where you can check out all of our snippets as well as all of the full hours of the Garden Hour. And if you have some time on a rainy day, I encourage you to check that website out. There's a lot of really good information there. So with that, I'm going to go ahead and hand it over to our moderator for today, our colleague, Druba DeCall. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Justin. Uh, so uh, I want to tell all of you that, so if you have any questions, you can uh, ask your questions. So uh, our colleague, Donna, had sent her name uh, on the ask questions here. Uh, you can send your questions to her or you can uh, just type in in the common chat box. All right. So uh, I'm sure uh, we all are excited to learn about the weather and the other topic in, uh, in the horticulture today. So we are going to start our talk with the, uh, with the weekly weather report from Dr. Uh, Anthony Lupo. Uh, Dr. Lupo, are you ready? And you can share your screen, please. I am ready to go. And uh, can everybody see my screen? Yes. Okay, I'm going to just put this into slideshow mode. Uh, as you can see, uh, I'm getting better at this. Or yes, you are good. At, getting better at uh, producing uh, better graphics. So it's got a little more pizzazz today than it has before. Um, so let's talk about uh, temperatures for the last few days. Uh, Monday was uh, pretty warm in the 60s. Yesterday we saw temperatures in the 70s and even some low 80s around the state, especially in Kansas City area uh, near Boone County. And even in the boot heel, we were in the low 80s. And uh, that was a big change from Monday. And Monday, again, was a little more seasonal, so temperatures have been on the increase, and we actually expect this for today as well. A little warmer temperatures. We have high pressure in control of things, especially to our south. The, uh, the front that was over the state uh, last night and uh, some of yesterday is finally moving north. And that means most of us will be on the warm side of this thing with warm air coming in. But it also comes with higher dew points. And uh, higher dew points are, of course, a mixed blessing because that means better potential for precipitation, but also a potential for some severe weather, uh, especially later today and tomorrow. Uh, the 500 millibar map. What's going on aloft? Right now, the uh, I'm showing you a, a map of the entire Northern Hemisphere so that you can get a sense of the whole jet stream. 
uh, what's happening out over the Pacific. And then you can see that the jet stream has been quite wavy over the United States, and that has meant up and down temperatures. And we've experienced that uh, for the last two, three weeks, this up and downness in temperatures. Uh, we have something out here in the Pacific that if it comes to fruition, I'll talk about it more, but uh, it's called a blocking anticyclone. And blocking anticyclones in this region of the Pacific near Alaska and Eastern Pacific usually mean a prolonged cold spell for us. So that's not good news. But uh, if it comes to fruition, we'll talk about it because any of the worst cold spells that you can think of in your life, if you've lived in Missouri, there's usually blocking behind it. So uh, maybe that'll be a topic for next week. Um, the uh, severe weather potential is mainly for you in North and West Missouri. You can see an enhanced risk of severe weather if you're way up in Bethany. Uh, but a chance of some thunderstorms getting down into the central part of Missouri, and that'll, of course, be later today and tonight. The south southern part of the state will have its turn early tomorrow and then for the rest of the day. All right, so just a review of, and it's becoming like a broken record at this point, that, uh, that the southern and eastern part of the state have seen plenty of precipitation in the last 30 days, these last running 30 days, uh, a bit in the north as well, but a uh, little bit drier here in northern Boone County and some other counties around us. And that, again, is still following the uh, long range outlook for spring. So this is becoming like a broken record, but a good broken record for some of us. Uh, drought conditions continue to stay uh, in abatement here in Missouri. Last week, we saw that there was maybe a little bit of um, uh, initial or the first signs of drought here in Boone County and counties adjacent that's still showing up uh, since we've had a dry week. But as long as that's not expanding, that's good news. All right, just to review, uh, again, March was below normal. April, last week I showed you April was roughly uh, three to five degrees above normal for the first part of it. And it's continuing on that path. We're continuing to stay uh, fairly strongly above normal across the state. And in terms of uh, temperatures, precipitation though, we're lacking in Boone County. We're now two inches down for the month, although we may see some relief. Uh, later on, but other areas of the state are also down, uh, except for St. Louis, they're pretty close to normal. And again, what was different between March and April? Believe it or not, these waves, these very long waves in the jet stream don't go west to east like you typically see. These go east to west. And uh, I won't get into the dynamics of why that is, but suffice it to say, these big ones do that. And the top graph here is what, what, look what we had in March. And pay attention to this low pressure and this high pressure, which in April are now over Alaska and over North America. These two waves have, or the, this wave has shifted from east to west, these long waves do that. And of course, with a ridge over the continental United States, that's contributed to our warmer weather. Uh, in terms of the difference between what we're seeing and what's normal, here was March again. This explains our cold anomalies in March in terms of temperatures. And in April, 
much of the eastern United States has been above normal. And again, we're seeing that continuing. Uh, the pros tell us that uh, expect rain to continue for southern Missouri. And I think the next few days is going to produce a good dousing for north and west of Missouri, which will help. Uh, we need some here in Boone County, but they're showing that we're in this little hole here that uh, Mother Nature has decided that <laughs> she wants to put here in the middle of Missouri. So I'm kind of hoping that some of these storms stay together a little longer and move into central Missouri. Again, the six to 10 day outlook is for above normal precipitation for much of the plains and southeast US. But again, below normal temperatures, below normal temperatures, and that may be a sign of that blocking event that wants to form in the Alaska region. So I'm, I'm a little bit concerned about that, and we'll get to that in my forecast. Uh, let's go to the three-week the uh, three week outlook. The three-week outlook is looking for above normal precipitation to continue across the Ohio Valley and the mid-Mississippi Valley, and a little bit cooler than normal across the northern tier of states. This is a big change from last week, because you remember the three to four week outlook last week was showing warmer than normal for across most of the east. And, and what I think is happening is we're beginning to see the pattern shift again. We'll probably see that longer wave ridge move out of the United States and uh, the advent of a little cooler weather. Again, you can check me out on the mid-Missouri weather page, but let's talk about forecasts. Most of us will see 70s and 80s today. Tonight, low 50s and uh, upper 50s, low 60s, but with some rain and thunderstorms in the northwest, you got to be on the alert for severe weather much later today and tonight. Uh, hopefully, again, some of that continues into mid-Missouri, but Southeast Missouri will have its turn on uh, Thursday morning and Thursday afternoon. Definitely not as severe as last Saturday where we saw an actual tornado hit Phelps County and uh, cause some injuries there. Tomorrow's, uh, tomorrow we'll see upper 60s to low 70s with lows in the uh, low 40s to low 50s. And the temperature gradient, I think, will be northwest to southeast in all of these forecasts. Friday, Saturday, again, some showers and thunderstorms late Friday into Friday night as a secondary front comes through. Low 60s on Sunday. And then Saturday, this is chilly for this time of year. Upper 40s to low 50s. I'm looking at upper 40s for Boone County. So maybe even mid 40s in, in the northwest part of Missouri. But then at night, upper 20s to low 30s. You want to be careful with those sensitive plants. Uh, if you haven't put them out yet, wait one more time. Because <laughs> it looks like it's going to be pretty chilly on Saturday night. Sunday into Tuesday, things are moderating more. But still remaining a little bit below the seasonal normal. Again, that's consistent with that six day outlook and the possibility of blocking in uh, the Pacific. And again, next week, I'll talk a little bit more about blocking and what it means and, and uh, why I even mention it in the first place. So any questions? All right. So Excellent. thank you so much. Yes, thank you so much, Dr. Lupo. So uh, Donna, uh, is there any questions for the Dr. Lupo? Uh, no, not at this time. All right. So thank you so much, Dr. Lupo. So uh, as it looks like, so we need to keep our cold sensitive plants and the pot inside this uh, this week and the weekend. So yeah. So this is this is Mother Nature and 
Yeah, so we cannot do anything on that. All right, so uh, now uh, we are we are moving ahead. And our first question for this week is, so I'm now, I'm now going to read the question. And uh, my colleague uh, Donna Aftenberg is going to uh, going to answer this uh, this questions. So the question is, what is the best way to prune the winter damaged limbs from endless summer uh, hydrangea? Donna, are you ready? Uh, yes, yes. All right. So endless summer hydrangeas is a type of um, hydrangea uh, macrophylla which is called a big leaf hydrangea. It is um, a cultivar uh, that has been selected for its repeating blooming um, throughout the season. So um, we've heard a lot of reports on shrubs and small trees and things that have been damaged from drought and the weather extremes, and we'll hear more about that later. Uh, but you know, if you do have damage like this, you know, this is, you know, one person asking how should they prune this shrub? Um, the big thing is to understand how a shrub sets its blooms and how it blooms. And so what we need to realize about endless summer is because it blooms multiple times during the year, it actually sets blooms on old wood and new wood. Um, and so typically um, for the old for the blooms on old wood, they set the, the bloom buds in the fall. And for blooms on the new wood, the blooms are set on, in the spring. So this gets a little trickier to prune versus a ordinary hydrangea, which um, blooms, depending on which hydrangea you have, uh, whether it blooms on old wood or new wood. And so that's a whole other scenario. But on endless summer hydrangeas, the biggest advice I can give you is to Take, start um, slightly bending the, the stems and seeing which ones are actually dead and which ones are alive. And you want to prune back into um, the, the live tissue. So you're gonna be pruning out that dead tissue. And so in slightly bending them, you can pretty quick tell which ones are alive and which ones are dead because the live ones still have some flexibility. They feel green, whereas the dead ones will snap or they, they're real crisp or they just don't feel like they have any life in them. And so that's where I would suggest you to start is find where that dead ends and the life begins and you want to cut back to the node um, that is first in that uh, the live tissue. Um, and of course, down below on the screen over to the right are proper, how to take that proper pruning cut. Uh, the first one is a good cut. It's going to be um, a little less than a 45 degree angle, more of a diagonal length uh, angle. Um, and you want to cut about a quarter of an inch before that bud. The middle one is too close, as you can see, it's going to be too close to that bud, the cut is, and it will create a very um, weak um, union where that, that branch hits that stem. And then, of course, um, over to the right, that's too much stem that's left. And so definitely try to do a cut similar to the one that is first in that picture. Um, <clears throat> so if you don't know what kind of hydrangea that you have and you're, you're concerned about pruning it, always remember the best choice that you can make is pruning right after the blooms fade. And that way there's no risk in cutting off any bloom buds. And that's what I usually recommend on most shr uh, shrubs that bloom. And mainly because you, you always want it to bloom in the spring or whenever it's supposed to. So in cutting it right after it blooms, there's no risk in cutting off those bloom buds. And just always remember, prune no later than July 1st. And, and that way we can prevent growth that won't harden before the first frost in the fall. Um, and so that's usually our deadline for any pruning. Okay, and that's all I have. All right, thank you. Thank you, Donna. So I don't know whether there is any questions for Donna or not. So if we have, uh, we'll take that later. Then our next question for the week is about the cherry tree. So the question was, my cherry tree started blooming this spring, then it stopped. Now uh, it's leafing out. So was the lack of blooms due to the early freeze we had? And this question will be answered by our colleague, uh, Justin Cage. So Justin has already uh, shared his slides. 
Dustin, go ahead. All right. Thanks, Truba. Um, yeah. So cherry trees, what's the deal? What happened to the blossoms? Um, the picture I'm showing here uh, are actually uh, sweet cherry trees in New York state um, being grown under high tunnels or greenhouses. Um, and we'll talk about why uh, that might be advantageous for uh, this specific crop. Unfortunately for Missouri, uh, sweet cherry trees are considered a marginal fruit crop, um, especially in the northern half of Missouri due to cold temperatures and freezes. Another reason uh, that can be challenging to find an appropriate site for cherry trees is because they require a very well-drained soil. Um, best planting locations are on are some of the river hills around the Mississippi and the Missouri River. Um, two reasons for that, um, both internal and external drainage of moisture uh, in the soil and on the landscape. So uh, when you plant on a site that has some elevation or some slope to it, um, the external drainage is better because that soil drains off the landscape as opposed to puddling up. And also internal drainage with a lost soil Lost soils are, are generally windblown soils from glacial deposits, um, have a little bit better internal drainage than some of our clay soils. So both uh, internal and external soil drainage are important uh, for any crop that requires well-drained soils. Uh, unfortunately, sweet cherries usually bloom early enough to where they can be damaged um, by spring frost or freezes. One thing to consider is position in the landscape, and this impacts um, frost and freeze. So when we plant high on a hill or high on the landscape, it gives the air an opportunity, opportunity to drain downhill. And if you've ever been out hiking or walking um, you know, downhill on a cool evening, you'll notice that that cool air really uh, intensifies and drains downward on the landscape. So if you can get these at the top of a slope, that might give you a little bit per, better protection um, from frost. You can create frost pockets though. If you see this image on the left-hand side, there's a large tree and maybe some shrubs at the bottom of that hill, and that will actually block that drainage of that cold air. So this might be challenging, um, you know, if you live, uh, if your yard's flat and your, your subdivision is flat and you're in a pretty flat area of the landscape, you're not going to have opportunity for this type of drainage of cold air. Uh, this is a picture from University of Virginia or Virginia Tech. Um, and you can see that there's green arrows and red arrows. So these pictures were taken after a nine hour frost event. And there was about a little bit greater than 50% mortality rate on the cherry flowers. So if we blow these up, we'll notice that the green arrow is pointing to an ovary that has not been damaged by frost, and the red arrow is pointing to a browned ovary that has been damaged by frost. And this can be used, you can use this uh, cross-section of buds to evaluate uh, freeze or frost damage on buds in a number of different fruit crops. Um, another thing to consider, uh, most sweet cherries do need cross-pollination, um, so you're going to need to plant two or more different cultivars. There are some exceptions. Um, Stella, Lapins, and Star Crimson are some varieties that are self-pollinating. Um, sometimes this information can be find, hard to find like at a big box store, but if you go to a, a good nursery or nursery catalog, um, they'll often list you know, good pollinizer varieties um, for a, sp a specific variety of cherry that you're planting. Tart cherries, however, they are more tolerant of frost and low temperatures, so that might be something to consider. Not necessarily as good for fresh eating as sweet cherries, but that might be an option. Um, some other challenges, cherries tend to crack after periods of intense rainfall. The fruit split, um, and they're going to rot if they're not ripe, they're not going to get to maturity. And then in Missouri, where we have uh, lots of rainfall and high humidity, there's problems with the disease called brown rot. So most of the sweet cherries grown in the United States are grown in Washington, Oregon, and California, where they have a little bit more moderate and mild coastal climate that allows for a longer growing season, as well as lower humidity, so less issues with fungal diseases. All is 
possibly not lost if you want to go to some efforts to protect um, fruit trees. This really only works best on very small plants, dwarf trees, or trees that have been pruned to maintain a low stature. Um, if you want to try something like this, you're going to need some kind of wire support or cage to um, hold down this frost blanket. Um, a frost blanket is fairly heavy weight, so it'll provide some insulation. But if you're going to set these up, it's best to set them up in the afternoon while the air temperatures are still high um, to kind of trap in some of that heat. And in addition, the soil is a great uh, reservoir of warmth and it will radiate some of that uh, warm soil temperatures up to the plants that are going to be uh, warmer than the existing air temperatures. So that's all I got. All right, Justin, thank you. So Donna, is there any questions for Justin? No, none, none at this time. All right, thank you. Oh, sorry about that. So I muted. So so the next question is about the controlling crabgrass from the flower bed in an organic way. So Donna is going to answer these questions. Donna, please go ahead. Oh, thank you, Jordan. So, um, you know, the first thing that I have to mention about organic control for crabgrass is, you know, I hate to say it, the easiest organic uh, remedy is to just hand pull it. Um, and, and I say that because there's not really any good organic remedies out there for weed control of crabgrass. I mean, there are um, things that you can try. Um, there are many over-the-counter over over organic herbicides that contain things like vinegar, different kinds of acids, oils, or even salt formulations um, that can burn out weeds. Um, but the problem with those is they um, are not specific to crabgrass. If you spray them, you risk the damage of your landscape plants or your grass that you would want to keep. Um, you know, and I'm talking about in, in turf grass there. Um, but they, you know, just keep in mind there are products available, but they don't always work really well. Um, the other thing that, that I came across was corn gluten. It is a nitrogen that you can um, apply for, you know, the fertility aspect of it. Or you can, at certain rates, up to 20 uh, pounds per thousand square feet, it can actually retard the growth of seeds that are just germinating. They don't truly kill the seeds, they just retard the growth, so they never de fully develop. Now, there is a lot of mixed research on corn gluten, whether it truly works. Um, so if you do try it, just be prepared that it might not work. But then again, you could um, it could demonstrate some control for you. Um, the big thing I have to caution when using the corn gluten would be that it is a nitrogen fertilizer. So uh, if it doesn't work as a seed retardant, then it may serve to cause the weeds to grow any fa even faster. So just be cautious when you're using that. Um, you know, and alter alternatively. You can always cover that soil with a new layer of three or four inches worth of mulch. And that's after the crabgrass has been um, uh, weeded out. And that way you're covering any seeds that might be existing. Seeds will germinate if they um, have light and moisture. And so in, in putting on new, a new, new layer of mulch, you're eliminating at least the light that would cause them to germinate. Um, and just keep in mind, there's other things that you can, uh, you can use um, weed barrier, you can use cardboard, you know, you can use anything to block that light. Um, they may not as be as attractive as mulch, but they would still perform the same duty. Um, but that's pretty much all there is on organic control. But my suggestion always is to try to just hand pull it and keep it under control. Okay, back to you, Jorba. All right, thank you. Uh, Donna. So our next question is about the woody uh, ornamental. So why are many of the woody ornamental plants not leafing out like normal and are swaying die back? So Debbie Kelly is going to answer these questions. Debbie? Yeah, I was trying to find my unmute button. So sorry about that. Yeah. So we um, 
have been getting lots of questions coming into the offices across the state um, saying that they've been seeing a lot of damage to their woody ornamental plants. And so I just want to say thank you to Donna. She shared a bunch of pictures with us. And so um, we just want to go through just to show you some of the things that are happening. And, and it is across the state. Um, so the boxwood on the left, you can see the damage is taking place there in the middle. Um, I know my mom has some boxwoods and every time I go to her house, I'm seeing some, some winter burn there as well. Uh, the middle picture is viburnum and you'll notice that there's some leaves that are coming down, down here, maybe a little bit at the tips, a lot of things that are in the middle there that are totally brown. Then on the right, we have the crepe myrtle, and you'll notice that there's just a little bit of leaves that are coming out along a few of those branches, and then they're really coming out at the bottom. A lot of this up at the top are not leafing out whatsoever. Then some more pictures, heavenly bamboo, and again, they're coming out a lot at the bottom, and you notice at the tops and in the middle, there's no leaves. And then the nandina, only just a little bit showing up here. And then on the, his, this is a rose bush on the right side. So if you see uh, a lot of folks, and I've had a couple of ca calls already talking about the roses and how they're just not leafing out. They just don't look well at all. A couple more pictures here. Here's another Nandina. Again, it's really coming out a lot in the bottom. And then this, chances are those are new leaves, but they look brown. So chances are they're not going to actually be doing well. Uh, those branches probably, yeah, you'd have to test those branches to see. Then in the bottom, we have a, a shrub rose. And again, it's coming out at the bottom. The top doesn't look very well. And then this plant on the right, um, Donna calls it a mop head. I call it a cousin it. So if you ever watch the Adams Family TV show and you can think of cousin it and what he looked like, that's what this shrub looks like. It's a golden mop thread leaf false cypress. And I have two in my yard. Uh, this is the one that is still alive that's in my yard. So you have an idea of what it looks like. My other one actually died. It was it was healthy last summer and this spring it was just totally dead. Nothing was coming out of it whatsoever. Um, so just to, to talk about this, what are some reasons as to why this is actually occurring and not just in certain locations, but across the state? So the dieback is one, remember last year, most of the state was in some form of a drought. Some of the state was in more of a drought than others, deep drought. So when we have drought, there is a chance that the, the uh, this particular um, issue with our woody plants called Botrysophyria canker, um, is a problem on a lot of our woody shrubs. And this actually occurs when we have extreme drought conditions. So those of you that are in the western part of the state and the southwest may see this actually popping up on some of your, your woody shrubs. Um, what you have to do is just kind of like what Donna said a little bit earlier when she talked about the hydrangeas is that go ahead and prune out the dead and dying branches. Make sure that you get rid of them just in case there's any kind of a disease in there. Uh, make sure you water those plants after you prune back because they're they're starting to try to regrowth and they're using a lot of their energy. So make sure that that you water them well. The other thing is 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 you know take that branch and kind of slightly bend it a little bit. And where if it's pliable, it's still alive. If it just kind of bends and it, sometimes it'll crack, then you know it definitely is, is not going to have any living tissue there. And so go ahead and, and prune it down to where it actually is having some, some tissue growth that's growing well. The other thing that happened is that if you notice right before Christmas, we had that real bad cold snap uh, where we went from a drastic change of being really nice, almost fall-like temperatures to going down to something that was really, really cold. I know on our horticulture calls this morning, uh, Dr. Michelle Warman had commented that in Columbia on December 22nd and 23rd, it got, got down to at least a minus eight degrees. I mean, that's a drastic change. So you must remember that um, these plants have, you know, some sort of liquid growing or moving throughout in the xylem and the phloem. Uh, water, um, 
carbohydrate sugars that are all moving in some sort of a liquid type of a format. And when temperatures change like that, the plant doesn't have time to acclimate over a, a uh, over that quick of a period of time, it usually takes a number of days to get acclimated. And so those that liquid inside that plant um, freezes and it, it bursts those cells. So the xylem and the phloem where the water and the food move is damaged. And so it can't take up water from the roots or can't move any food um, throughout the entire area where it's been damaged. Go ahead and prune those off. Um, cut them back as far as you can where the dead wood is. The other thing that we want to look at is that a lot of these different plants will go ahead and come back out, giving some time. And it'll take time before they grow back to the state of what they were before they, they received any damage. Make sure you test again to where that dead tissue is versus the live tissue. Cut below that live tissue line. Make sure you prune all of your bushes before July 1st. Remember our fall blooming bushes set their buds for flowering in the, uh, in the spring, I'm sorry, in the middle of summer. So we want to make sure that you don't prune after that time frame. Otherwise, you definitely won't have flowers next year. The other thing to know is that if you prune past July 1st, even if it's not a blooming spring bush, that you could have lots of growth of spurts of growth of the of that particular bush. Um, and it could be really tender. And if we have a real cold snap early fall, it could do damage once again to that new growth. Water, water is always important. This is something we kept talking about last year and I did during the winter months is that plants really do need to have water. We think that roots of plants go deep when they're trees and shrubs, and a lot of times they don't. They're, they're pretty shallow, about 12 inches into that top soil there. And so make sure that you water. And we generally say rule of thumb is about one inch of water a week. So if we don't get regular precipitation, make sure you pay attention. And especially this year, if you've got damaged woody ornamentals, make sure you water them and keep them watered. And then fertilization is something to think about. The plant is using all of its excess energy to try to re refoliate, revitalize that plant and to start growing it. Where it's lost all of the, the carbohydrates and the sugars in the entire tree or the entire bush, it's lost those now. So it's really trying to use up as much energy as it has. Um, so go ahead and lightly fertilize with a well-balanced fertilizer, but you probably want to make sure that you do a soil test just to see if there are any kind of nutrients that might have been missing in the soil um, so that you can replenish those back and hopefully get those plants to grow back so that they can be a beautiful bush or shrub that you had in your yard before. That's all I have. All right, thank you, Debbie. So it is very, very informative. Uh, so our next topic is about the wildflower identification. So on this topic, again, Donna is going to talk. Donna, are you ready? Yes, okay. So I had the pleasure a couple of weekends ago to go to Alley Springs, which is down in Shannon County near Eminence, Missouri. And if you look on the Missouri map at the top left picture, you can see where Eminence was. It's about, uh, uh, two and a half hours from me, a um, little further than I thought it was, but that that's great because I'm down in Cape Girardeau, but it was a nice, beautiful day. Um, and I always, I went to this location a couple of times in the last year, and I just love going because I get to enjoy those early spring wildflowers. And, you know, I know that's one thing, um, I'm not well versed in early spring wildflowers. So that's why I like to go because it's an educational opportunity and I get to enjoy things that I don't normally enjoy. And so I encourage all of you to get out and take the hikes and go on the nature trails and look for some of these early spring ephemerals or wildflowers as we refer to them. Um, so over to the right is one shot of Alley Springs. And of course the bottom is the opposite side of Alley Springs. Such a beautiful location has a lot to offer. Um, you know that especially that area has a lot to offer when we talk about waterfalls and natural springs, and they're just it's amazing. Um, so I encourage everybody to get out and take a look at it. So just some of the early spring flowers that we were able to identify 
Um, so we have Walt Sweet Williams that's up top left. Then the next one to the right is Dwarf Spiderwort. Then beside it is Large Flower Bellwort, which I found so fascinating because these little um, bell-shaped yellow flowers hang and they sort of nod in the wind. And so they're just adorable. And then of course, um, over to the far right, we have Wood Spurge. And at the bottom, we have Wild Columbine. So, you know, if there's, if you have a wooded area at home, this is also an opportunity for you to take a look at what's possible for your wooded area. Remember, you can't dig any of these because they, they are protected. But what you can do is seek them out at your local nursery or um, some of the online uh, native plant distributors. And so, yes, definitely they're prime examples of what can be used in wooded areas. Um, to the far left, we have Larkspur. Um, next, we have Wild Geranium. Then we have Fire Pinks, which is the third picture. And over to the far uh, right, we have Bird's Foot Violet, which is the purple looking flowers, which is a really neat flower. And then we have um, Hori Pacoon, which is the little yellow ones. And oh, they are so adorable. They're so small, but they're just, uh, they're just breathtaking. And then of course, they had lots and lots of hillsides of Rose Verbenia. And you just look in the distant hills and you can see shades of different pinks and purples. And when you get closer, you realize, oh, wow, they're just packed with those rose verbena. And as you can tell, I get so excited about this because I just absolutely love flowers and I love learning about things that I don't normally um, see a lot of. And so a lot of you might think, okay, how did you learn what all those were? Well, one thing is, um, you know, I have wonderful colleagues that I can shoot pictures to. And so you can always shoot pictures to us for identification. But there are also wonderful resources online and um, as apps for iPhones and Android, Android phones. So um, we, the first um, four um, are actual websites that you can go on and you can select flowers by color, by leaf arrangement, by time of bloom. And they're just wonderful resources to keep um, on your uh, bookmarks, on your favorite search engines. And that way you, it's a go-to for you. Um, and you can even keep them on your phone. And they're, they, they're really easy to use. I really like the apps. And that's what we were walking around doing is snapping um, pictures of these, uh, these flowers. And I like to use Seek by iNaturalist. That's probably my favorite, but there are others that will work just as well iNaturalist, Picture This, Leaf Snap, Nature ID, Plant In and Plant Snap are all very good. Um, and, and, but they will all do about the same thing. And they're very good at identifying uh, what, is in it, what is out there. You know, and if it can't ID, identify it, it will at least tell you what family the, the plants are in. And so it gives you a good head start of where to look what that flower um, might be. And so I really encourage all of you to get out there and try using some of these websites and some of these apps. I think it's great when we can continue to learn and experience new plants. Okay, that's all I have. Back to you, Deriva. All right, thank you so much, Donna. So our next topic is uh, taking a soil sample for your lawn, garden, or, uh, or uh, a flower bed or ornamental landscape. So Justin is going to talk. Justin, please go ahead. So you are not in the presentation. Okay, you are now, yes. Okay, thanks, Ruba. Um, so one of the great services that University of Missouri and other land-grant institutions offer uh, across the country um, is soil testing. And so we're gonna talk about why it's important and why it's helpful for you. So we can check the nutrient status of our soil um, every soil, even if it has not been amended, contains a certain amount of plant nutrients that are necessary for growth. Um, many times existing gardens, they might, may already have sufficient nutrients, um, adding fertilizer and compost and manure, you might have a good bank of nutrients already in that soil. Um, adding nutrients you don't need and spending money on fertilizer is, is just a waste of money. Also, excess nutrients as they build up in your garden soil can cause problems. They can be antagonistic and block the uptake of other nutrients. Phosphorus, for instance, if it's too high, can block the uptake of iron and zinc. Uh, it's also important not to apply excess nutrients because 
water uh, pollution, nutrient pollution in waterways and water bodies is a really uh, big problem uh, in the United States. And a lot of that is tied to fertilizer runoff, both from home landscapes and from farm landscapes. Another thing to consider is plant nutrients such as phosphorus and potassium. These are mined elements from the Earth's crust, and they are finite resources in terms of how much we can actually pull up from the ground and turn into fertilizer. Um, every fertilizer has a carbon footprint, whether that's tied to the mining or the shipping of that material, or nitrogen, for instance. Nitrogen uh, is captured from the atmosphere through a process called the Haber-Bosch process. It requires a ton of energy, temperature, and pressure to capture that atmospheric nitrogen and turn it into a plant available form. So that's another thing to keep in mind when we're talking about environmental concerns. Soil pH. Um, your soil pH may be too high or too low. Maybe you added a lot of lime already, or maybe you added wood ash. Those can both raise soil pH, or maybe it's too low because you have a native soil that tends to be a little bit more acidic. So when we soil test, we can understand what our soil can provide and what we may still need to add. And you're going to get specific recommendations for specific plantings, uh, fertility recommendations, as well as recommendations to adjust soil pH. So this allows us to apply exactly what's needed and nothing more so we can avoid some of the runoff associated with uh, eutrophication, where you have these algal blooms that lowers the oxygen level and hurts aquatic organisms, or thinking about the big picture, uh, the dead zone in the Gulf of Mexico, where you have depleted oxygen levels um, at the output outflow of the Mississippi River that is tied to upstream fertilizer runoff. Uh, I heard a soil scientist say one time the most important thing you can understand about your soil is your soil pH. Um, most of our garden plants like to be somewhere between 6 and 7, 6.2 to 6.5. You can see these bands. One of the reasons is nutrient availability. If we look at phosphorus, which is the second band down, we can see that below a pH of 6, phosphorus becomes minimally available. So that element may be in the soil, but it's bound up in a chemical form that plants are unable to uptake. So pH affects uh, plant nutrient availability in the soil. Uh, many Missouri soils are acidic, and if they've been, been unamended, they may need lime to adjust to more neutral pH. Uh, over time, soil will revert to its native pH. So even if you added lime uh, five or six years ago, that soil may have reverted back to a more acidic state. Some plants have different pH preferences, so most like to be between six and seven, but we have acid-loving crops, and we might need to add sulfur uh, to get that soil pH down. Another uh, interesting thing that you get from the soil test report is your percentage of soil organic matter. So soil organic matter helps build soil structure. You can see in this image in the bottom, we have this little tiny piece of organic matter. It's being colonized by bacteria and fungi that release uh, mucus, and then these fungal hyphal threads help bind the soil particles together and create these soil colloids, which are the foundation of a good soil structure that improves drainage and allows roots to penetrate the soil. Soil organic matter also supplies nitrogen. So if we have 5% organic matter, that's going to release about 100 pounds of nitrogen per acre. To give you a point of reference, tomatoes may need 110 pounds. So if you have sufficient organic matter, you might not actually need to apply any nitrogen, um, especially in exi existing gardens that have been amended heavily uh, with organic matter through the form of compost or manure, um, might not necessarily need organic matter. And as we build organic matter levels above five, six, seven, eight percent, that's another way we can get excess nutrients in the soil. But you won't really know any of this um, until you soil test. So if you want to test your soil, um, you want to sample uh, about eight to 12 subsamples. So you go into your garden with a little hand trowel, dig down to about six inches, throw it in a bucket, make sure it's a clean bucket that's been rinsed out if it's had any kind of fertilizer, manure, or compost in it, because that can skew the soil test results. So you're going to take a number of subsamples, um, around eight or so, that will give you a composite representative sample. If you take just one shovel full, you could have a piece of bird poop on there, could make your phosphorus and potassium look much higher than it is. So we go down to about six inches deep, 
you'll want to provide separate samples for your garden, your vegetable garden, for instance, separate sample for your lawn. And then if you have ornamental plantings on the front of the house, for instance, you would want to sample those separately because they've probably been fertilized differently and might need uh, require different nutrients. You're going to take that bucket, mix up about two cups, mix those samples thoroughly, and you can take them, uh, send them to the lab or drop them off at your local extension center. Make sure you label the samples for reference. So when you get them back, um, you'll know what they correspond to. And that's all I got. All right. Thank you so much, Justin. So Donna, is there any questions for Justin or um, anyone? No, um, not at this point. All right. Thank you, Donna. Uh, thank you, Justin. So our next topic uh, for today's talk is, so this will be the last uh, uh, topic and uh, Debbie will talk on some about the horticulture terminologies. Debbie, are you ready? Yeah, I'm trying to, to get okay. myself organized here. So I apologize for the delay. Um, so the first thing I want to do is with the hort terminology is um, I have the word Samara. And so um, Jared, can you put the little uh, poll up please for me? All right, let me see. Oh, I think I can do that. Okay, so we have Samara. And so the question is, what is a Samara? Is it a kind of flower, a dry fruit seed, a type of root? I always like seeing people and, and their answers. I appreciate that you all partake in this. All righty. I'm going to go ahead and. Um, and the poll, share the results. So 27% of you say it's a kind of flower, 63% say a dry fruit seed, and 10% say it's a type of a root. Um, and I'll tell you what, the answer is B. So it is a dry fruit seed, and we're probably seeing them all over the place right now in our yards on concrete, uh, driveways and sidewalks. Um, this is what a Samara is. It's a type of a dry fruit as opposed to something that's going to be really fleshy like an apple, a peach. Peach is one of my favorites. Um, a mango even, for example. Um, it is a dry indehiscent fruit, which means that it doesn't split open to release a seed. Um, the actual seed will start to germinate inside the casing of, of um, what it's in right now. Um, and eventually after it starts to germinate, it will break free of that, what I call the helicopterness of the maple seeds there. I just thought this was a beautiful picture. Um, and so a lot of us will call it a helicopter. Some people will call it a whirly bird. I've always called it a helicopter. And as a kid, uh, before it started to actually dry, you can see that it's starting to dry on the edges here. But if it were all 100% green like this, where you could take it and put it up to your mouth and kind of make a whistle out of it as well. Um, but that's what Samara is. Um, so you guys are really smart. I enjoy doing the horticulture terminology with you just simply because I, it, I, I'm impressed with how smart you guys all are out there. Dhruva, back to you. All right, Debbie, thank you so much. So uh, looks like uh, we have finished the talk for the today's topics. Uh, so Donna, is there any questions? Um, no, just um, on the uh, range of the cost of soil testing, and I answered that it ranges from 20 to $30 um, uh, from county to county, and that's just basically due to their cost and, and shipping. Yeah, and that is, yeah, and that cost is for the regular testing. So that includes like soil pH, phosphorus, potassium, calcium, magnesium, organic matter, CEC, and like that. So just to make clear. All right. So with this, uh, Justin. So I will I will get back to you as a host. Thank you. 
All right. Thanks, Druba. And thanks, everybody, for joining us again for the uh, weekly live garden hour during the growing season. Um, we'll be going every week throughout the growing season. We do really like to get your questions. Um, so if you would like to submit your questions, um, you can submit, submit them at our registration site, um, ipm.missouri.edu slash town halls. Uh, we also really like to have pictures and that allows you um, to also submit pictures in addition to your questions. Um, we always put a lot of links in the chat box, uh, can be a little bit hard to keep up with, but if you go down to the chat box and click on these three links at the bottom, uh, you'll pop up an icon that you can save the chat, save that to your computer and come back to for future reference. Uh, once again, we have horticulture specialists with MU Extension across the state of Missouri. Um, if you haven't reached out to your horticulture specialist, take a second there to jot down their email. Um, we're always happy to answer your plant questions and to help you grow. Uh, this is what the registration form looks like uh, if you want to submit questions. So feel free to do so. We're always happy to have your questions. It lets us know what's going on um, across the state of Missouri. And we look forward to seeing you next week.